Fletch has just told me that we've had a pretty special guest on the show today, Rhino. Who's that then, Tom? Well, Fletch has just told me to tell everyone that it was uh, Jeremy Jem Evans of Bike Club Hossigo. The CEO of Bike Club Hossigo. The CEO of Bike Club Hossigo. And I've learned only after talking to him, I didn't get to ask him about this, also of the London Underground. What's that all about? So I heard about this. This is all about the image of Jem plastered all over the London underground of a shot of him backhand tube riding at some secret Gower slab. That is amazing. I didn't realise that. So, yeah. so he, was, he was on the side of all the tube trains. That's right, yeah. Pulling into a barrel. That is amazing. Well, Doesn't that is an excuse that, to get him back. Um, Jem's a fabulous storyteller. And for this episode, a bit of a change to our normal format, because um, this episode, I suppose, comprises one story, you know, in its entirety, um, told brilliantly by Jem, um, of the couple of summers uh, that he, he spent in the company of none other than three times world surfing champion and sort of, you know, one of the, one of the sports goats, Tom Curran, a trip that you were sort of present for at the kind of beginning of that tale. I certainly was. And we were lucky enough to hear the follow on story from that, from where Jem spent the last, what, two years with Tom yeah. and was probably now can actually class him as a, a as a friend. Amazing, amazing, yeah, and and he's told it in great detail, all of it, to uh, Crest Podcast in partnership with Elusive, and it's here for your ears. So here we go. It's uh, Jeremy Jem Evans of Bike Club Hossigo, and uh, a great insight into the enigma, the legend that is Tom Curran. <laughs> It's not often that some of the biggest names in surfing show up in Wales, so when they do it lives long in the memory. Such is the tale of Tom Curran's 2002 visit. This is the story of how he got here and of how our own Jem Evans went on to host the Triple World Champ across three consecutive summers. What's Tom Curran like as a couch guest and what's it like to surf with him while in his prime day after day? Welcome to the show, Jem. Hello. <laughs> How's it going, alright? Yeah, very good. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Um, now, we've got a unique little situation here because uh, one of our regulars, Rhino, is sitting on the fence this time between presenter, guest, roving reporter, fact checker, fact stretcher, all <laughs> the stuff that makes a good surf yarn a good surf yarn. Because uh, Rhino is a participant in the amazing tale which will form the bulk of our interview with Jem. So uh, welcome back, Rhino. Good to have Jem on, eh? Certainly is, Tom, and I'm really looking forward to hearing some tales of a certain world surfing champion that not many people get to hear of. Yeah, but, but custom is custom, uh, and so for the benefit of the listener, let's do a, a little intro to Jem. Now, I remember, as a grommet, being both terrified and in awe of this guy. Uh, firstly, he was friends with Herbie, Hugh John who was tantamount to Don Corleone in the 90s, uh, or in the 90s South Wales surf scene, at least. Um, secondly, Jem spoke both French and Italian. And thirdly, because as a surfer, he absolutely ripped. Uh, a turn of the millennium trip to Thurso with him, and Rhino as it happened, underscored my admiration for his surfing as we lucked into some of the best waves I'd ever seen. Jem threading them deftly on his backhand for hours at a time. I remember going home and telling someone, Jem really goes for it in the heavy stuff and getting a reply, yeah, I've seen that happen too. Uh, a stint working in the surf industry uh, and a lifetime of travel. He's now a resident in France where I'm sure his love for a deep pit is regularly sated. By far the most amazing Jem moment I remember though was when he brought Tom Curran to my hometown as if he were just another random traveller that Jem had hooked up with on the road. Uh, an incredible set of circumstances, combining to mean that he was travelling with someone even more spellbinding than Herbie. <laughs> <laughs> and spellbinding, Tom, leads me quite nicely into something that really sticks out about Jem Surfing's repertoire. It's that backhand tube riding technique that first oh, caught yeah. my eye and would be the envy of many a seasoned pro. Jem expertly perfected his backhand barrel riding at the Gower Reefs and later on he travelled far and wide to the razor sharp reefs of Indonesia, the death slabs of Morocco, isolated islands off New Zealand, and most recently, the dredging, thick-lipped, barreling waves of Hossegor. 
It's Jem's love for heavy waves, coupled with a similar interest in the surf industry, that led us both on an unlikely path that one day would take us on a once in a lifetime surf stroke work trip with Tom Curran. <laughs> But that story didn't end there for Jem, though, Tom. Yeah, because uh, I've since learned that uh, that Jem had uh, Tom Curran staying with him uh, over a couple of seasons after that as well. And so, you know, it does mean that we've got a really unique insight through Jem into quite possibly one of the most sort of interesting people to have existed, really, in you know, in in all of surf culture. And I think what makes Curran such an interesting person to talk to as well, uh, talk about, is the way that he kind of. Um, you know, he, he he is that deadly competitor, you know, a three times world champion, but then also, you know, just just a such a creative surfer and really kind of someone who straddles, um, you know, that kind of the sport and the art side of surfing. Um, but first of all, we should we, we should bring Jem. jem has been sitting there listening to us say all of that. How are you doing? Are you still there now, Jem? You haven't fallen asleep I, yet. I You're just talking about you there. Fallen asleep. <laughs> um, I'm slightly embarrassed and very humbled. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I'm bright red as well. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's because that's you've got the sun down there earlier in France yeah. than you have here, <laughs> isn't it? Tan, yeah. So how, France, so you're living there now. Um, so, so since since you left Wales, Jem, which is when you know most of our listeners will have last seen you when you when you were a resident here, where yeah. where have you been? Because I understand you've been sort of around the world a couple of times, really, before settling down in France again. Well, we just we've done a bit of travelling. We um, we left we left Mumbles and spent a year in Dubai, and then uh, after a year there, we moved to Sweden, um, which was supposed to be for a few months, but we ended up staying for a, a year and a half. And we took some some time off and travelled. We've got a, a young son. Uh, before he went to school, we took the opportunity just to to do a bit of travelling with him. So we spent six months in Australia, France, uh, Indonesia, and New Zealand. Um, and then we briefly went back to Sweden with the plan to move to Hossegor. And we've been here now for just under two years. Wow. Yeah. And so when you were in Dubai... Um they say is this a, you surfed the, the the wadi adventures pool yeah rhino and i rhino came out to stay um on holiday so yeah so rhino uh steve charles from fourth call who's also living out in dubai at the time we had a yeah. we had a day at the wadi which is which is pretty interesting it's good fun i think it's mm. um it's a it's a novelty and that particular wave isn't isn't brilliant it's not particularly powerful and is often broken so but it's a really good it's, yeah it's a really good like it's a great novelty experience and from wales um relatively sort of near to Porthcall, you were a lalliston boy growing up weren't you and uh, and and i remember also hearing some enjoyable tales about what it's like to sort of you know try and get into that Porthcall surfing crowd as a grommet you know when you when you come from uh well, Lalliston, which is, I suppose, counts as Bridgen, technically, doesn't it? The Lantic it's, boys will be trying to poach you now. The, the transfer window <laughs> I nonsense. I can tell you that it's horrific. It's, you're, <laughs> you're, you're, the, you're just labelled as an outcast and a kook and a town boy. It's, um, it's really difficult. Like, surfing's hard enough anyway. And then to add on top of that, that no one will talk to you and, and everyone kind of hassles you in the water to begin with is, is yeah, it's pretty difficult. But saying that... Like after persevering for for many years, eventually the boys sort of let me into the to their group, and then obviously now I've become very good friends with with everyone. So hopefully yeah. I, I've been accepted. But yeah, yeah. coming from Lalliston is not great for for, for <laughs> working your way up the lineup in Porth Call, that's for sure. <laughs> and then you also spent a stint uh, living in the Gower as well, didn't you? Yeah, well, um, very fortunately, my, my mum and dad had a caravan in Port Island, which is oh, not nice. far away from the, the Gower Reefs um, yeah. when, we were, when we were growing up. And then um, they had a, a small bungalow there, which I was allowed to rent off them when I was in university. Yeah. So yeah, I went to Swansea Uni and lived in Port Island, which is, which is great. It's, a, it's one of the best places to be. Oh, that sounds amazing. Yeah. And uh, now, Jem, as always, besides uh, surfing, he's always been very good at, uh, at sales. Um, and uh, for for a while, you you were you were repping during the halcyon days of um, Double Overhead. I think it was it was for Globe, the Realm, and a couple of other brands, wasn't it? And, and that was how this um, first sort of uh, do we call it a chance encounter? Or do we call it, you know what was it? Uh-huh. The encounter with Tom Curran came about. It was yeah. That's um, we were just fortunate. Uh, fortunate, unfortunate. Um, Brad had acquired the brand, the Realm, um, for distribution in Europe. And then through a series of events, we ended up 
um, designing and manufacturing the clothes ourselves. And then on top of that, I think something happened with the trademark in the States. So we were then required to send out sponsorship packages to the existing Realm riders. And all of this started, um, Rhino and I had just come back off uh, our respective sales tours, me up north in Scotland and Rhino in uh, Wales and Cornwall. And uh, Brad said, oh, look, I've got a, you know, what are you doing? And um, uh, back in the day, you were able to say, well, not much at the moment. If you weren't out selling, there really wasn't very much to do. And he's like, oh, look, I want you to go up to the warehouse and, and pull out a sponsorship package for, for one of our American riders. And we were like, oh, great. And he handed us the piece of paper and he goes, oh, by the way, it's, it's Tom Curran. And so <laughs> you know, Ryan and I had a, like a, a Chandler and <laughs> Joey moment, our friends. We're like, oh, my God. So, you know, we went up the warehouse and, and were wandering around picking out clothes for Tom, um, deciding which colors we thought he might like best in his T-shirts. <laughs> Uh, it's just pretty surreal, um, and that was the that was the first sort of the first vague contact that we had. You know, we knew that he was riding for us, and it was one of the reasons why Brad um, took the brand on because he was their their title sponsor at the time. Right, um, and then things developed a little bit more. Um, Brad called us into his office again, and he said, "Oh, look, I've I've got some bad news for you. Um, I know you've only just come out from back on, you know, come back home from being out on the road and selling." You need to go back out on the road again. Um, the, you need to go and do like a promotional tour with a sponsored rider. Oh, and by the way, it's Tom. So we were like, Tom well, Curran. yeah, not Tom yeah, this time. Tom, yeah. yeah, Tom Curran. <laughs> we were like, oh, okay, okay. And a little unsure that he was telling the truth. And you know, we thought maybe he was like some kind of practical joke. And he was like, no, it's serious. You're gonna, you're gonna drive to France. You're gonna pick him up, and you're gonna drive him around France for a week. Um, do some poster signings or some shop signings and do some contests. And then you're going to bring him to Cornwall and do the same and South Wales and do the same. There you go. Off you go. Here's your itinerary. <laughs> um, go and pick him up. And same That's thing pretty with heavy detail. Uh, so you, yeah. Just you know, at that point, um, even though we've been putting clothes in a, in a box for him, you know, we thought that was amusing. Um, hearing him say that was, was pretty surreal. Uh, same thing, Rhino, Rhino and I left his office and sort of looked at each other and we just like, started laughing, going, wow, you know, if this is true, it's going to be great fun. And, and that was the start of it. Like, it, it, was, it was definitely a thing. We booked our ferries. Um, we, we got given a, phone, a mobile phone number, which was Tom's number. Um, we drove to the ferry port uh, and with the, our itinerary was drive to Biarritz, pick him up, uh, drive up the west coast of France, surf and, and do like promotional events and bring him back to double overhead in Porth Call. Yeah. Um, and when, when, where and how did you first actually meet him then? Well, we, um, we, we drove down like, so the, the first thing we did, we, we loaded everything up and we, we got on the ferry. Um, Rhino and I are, are best of friends, you know, in, in and outside of work. And we hadn't really seen each other for two months. So we got on the ferry. We were all excited about hanging out with each other a, a little bit. So we, we had a few beers on the ferry thinking that we were on like one of the longer channel crossings. Uh, and then a few people that were that noticed that we were getting quite boozed said, oh, you do realize that's France over there, don't you? And like, like, what do you mean? And like, oh, that, <laughs> Great start yeah. to the trip. <laughs> that, that's France, like we're here. And we were like, we're pretty oiled. So <laughs> yeah, a, a little bit too excited. We, um, yeah. we managed to get off the ferry and, and sleep it off in the, in the lay-by in the ferry port. Um, our, our instructions were really simple, like drive to, to Biarritz, pick him up or call him, pick him up and bring him back. So the, our first meeting with him, we, we'd had a surf in the morning and we drove down to, to Biarritz. Uh, I called his number as we were driving down. And someone picked up and they were like, yeah, hello. I'm like, oh, hi, is, it, is, that, is that Tom? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, hi, this, this is Jem and uh, Rhino from, from Wales. He's like, oh yeah, 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 okay. So like, oh my God, he's, he's got our number and he knows who we are. So it was a really good start. We're like, oh, look, j just, you know, can you tell us where you are? We'll, we'll come and find you. So he gave us his address. We managed to find it. Pulled up, but um, it's in a, uh, his, one of his, well, his, his residents in, in the south of France is just above Champ d'Amour uh, in right. Biarritz or like at the end of Anglet, start of Biarritz. Yeah. So we, we pull up and we call him. We're like, oh, hey, you know, we're downstairs. And then down he comes. It's just all, all normal. He just walks out. He's like, hi. Except that it's Tom Curran. 
Yeah, except that it is Tom Curran, and I, uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I've, yeah, you know, I've had posters of the guy on my wall all my life, or I certainly used to, uh, and the same yeah. with Rhino, and then yeah. out he comes. Yeah, and me. Yeah. yeah. Yep. The first... I think one of the things that we had actually said to each other beforehand, and it was the agreement, yeah. was that uh, although we had that Joey and Chandler m- moment, we got that out the way early on, yeah, so that when the time came, that it's like right, shoo, me Just... and you, it's. Totally yeah. normal. That's it. Let's yeah, yeah keep keep it on the level because obviously we get to hear about Tom Curran and we don't want to upset him too much. And but then obviously there was the agreement with the photographs. We were, you know it was we were really lucky. It was before I think it was like it was the advent of camera phones and they didn't really work. It was at the time if you sent a, an MMS or if you sent a, a picture message, it took about ten days to arrive at the destination phone. You know, yeah. the technology wasn't very good. Yeah, yeah. Um, everyone had digital cameras. And Ryder and I had a relatively serious conversation. And we said, what are we going to do? And we just said, well, you just got to act, just act normal. Like you just, yeah. as if it's not a thing, as if it's just, you know, as if it's just one of the boys. Uh, we also yeah. made an agreement, like not to, you know, we definitely don't ask to take any photos. Just, you've got, just, you know, just treat it like one of the boys from Porth Call. We're just yeah. picking someone up. We're just going surfing. You know, just, yeah, just act normal. Uh- I think I think you guys, you know, th- th- this story is legendary, you know, sort of in 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 our our local surf folklore now, you know. And I actually do think that that is a massive decision that you guys made there. That is probably the reason why the the experience has ended up being so special because he is probably used to people constantly you know oh, i'm with tom curran you know and like sort of thinking about what they can get for themselves from that yeah. situation whereas i think by sort of placing yourselves in the moment and going well it's just a surf trip with a guy mm. um you know oh, he's, he's then ended up being able to sort of enjoy you guys' company and uh, you know and then that that's how it's ended up being um <laughs> the amazing experience that it is it certainly has been yeah retailer in surf skate or e-bikes Contact Full Charge, suppliers of Venon and Studio surfboards, Pro Light leashes, Sniper bodyboards, Churchill swim fins, Ari Nui seps, Voltaway e bikes, plus many more. We can also help you advertise your business by designing your own branded embroidered changing robes and towels. For more, contact Full Charge Rhino at gmail.com. And we, we obviously met Tom down at his house. And one of the things about being normal um, for us was being able to go and spend some time with obviously where he lived, but also with his kids, his younger kids at the time. Yeah, like when we turned up, you know, I think he was expecting us to sort of say, uh, you know, hey, Greg, you know, great, grab your boards, grab your bag and we're off kind of thing. And uh, but we turned up like with zero agenda. And we also had a few days where we didn't have to, to do very much. And um, so we, we said hello and shook hands and uh, like exchanged pleasantries. And then um, we said, oh, hey, you know, do you want to go surfing? He's like, yeah, great. Let's, you know. And he goes, oh, do you mind if I bring my children? We're like, oh, Tom, it's, of course not. Bring your children. So the first thing we did is, like, you know, take him and his, and his family down the beach. Uh, Rhino and I went for a surf. The surf was pretty much the whole time, or certainly when we were in, like, Hossegore and down in the southwest, was huge. So we went out. We were pretty keen to surf. Um, and where, where were you surfing at Anglet Hill? Yeah, you... just like um, like Sean Damour, which is like you know yeah. right at the, the southern end of Anglet, and it was yeah. I don't know, it was six foot onshore closeouts. Um, <laughs> it was my first experience of surfing in front of him, and certainly in my mind, I just felt like I, I could barely get to my feet. I just felt so <laughs> so much pressure, and I would have been over trying so much. And it's the theme, like right, certainly right through like the first couple of weeks of this first trip, I was just, I can just remember thinking, oh my God, this is so embarrassing. I can't do a turn. Oh. <laughs> so uh, he didn't do that someone day. Like him thinks when, you know, I mean, Jem, you know, you, you, you surf extremely well, you know, you're, you're a Welsh national champion back in the day. And, and Ryan, what does someone like Tom Curran think when they watch a mortal surf? Like what, what do they think? I wouldn't like to comment. I've got to say, <laughs> I, no, because I, I know, he think. There's, I know there are people. Maybe he's watching the wave. I know, possibly. So he's never. He's uh, there's a there's one or two things I can say, and I, there's uh, there's only so so much I can say. He doesn't comment if someone like if if normal people like ourselves are surfing, he never comments. I've never heard him say anything negative about anyone surfing. Really. Um, 
but he's only ever like commented in a positive manner on the very highest <laughs> elite athletes. All right. but I've heard him. I've heard him talk, and like it's, you know, it's pretty predictable. I've heard him talk about Kelly Slater surfing, saying, "Oh yeah, he's, he surfs really good." I've heard him yeah. talk about Andy Iron surfing, and he's like, "Oh yeah, he, he surfs really, really good." And uh, Martin Potter, and then yeah, just pretty much ex world champions. So yeah. I wouldn't yeah, ever. Within that, yeah. Potts was probably granted his world title by Curran taking the year off as well, wasn't he? Oh, that's that's debatable. Yeah, I think Martin won it on right. To be fair, yeah, yeah, he did. Uh, uh, was it was Potts' world title the year before Curran's famous trials? Um, return then was it because he'd taken the year off which was the year Potts won it 1989 and then 1990 is the year he goes through the trials to, yeah, to, yeah, trials to, win to win the world title out. which is one of the most incredible achievements in the history of the sport I yeah. think really yeah, for so sure. what, what, what did Tom surf like in uh, Sean Moore that so he day? didn't so that, like the I think you know like all, all of this like the whole story kind of gels together for all of the tiny little reasons like there was no pressure on him to surf that day like he'd obviously Either the surf was that bad, which it never is for him, that he didn't want to go in. I just think he wanted to hang out with his with his children. Like mm. Nathan came in and surfed a little bit um, and got out. Like the surf was terrible. Rhino and I surfed for about three hours because we didn't know what else to do. Um, <laughs> and they just hung out on the beach. Um, so at that point, yeah, we, we hadn't seen him surf. Um, and at that point, I was ready to give up surfing. So I, just, <laughs> I just couldn't do anything. It's terrible. Mm. So then, uh, and, and so obviously this was the beginning of our trip. So we decided like we, we were starting to like move north a little bit. So we moved up to a, a place called Molliettes, I think it was, wasn't that right? And obviously by this time story was get the sort of people were getting to know a little bit that uh, Tom Curran was around and there was a, he was doing a little bit of a trip, but we ended up staying in a hotel, didn't we? And uh, yeah. after a couple of, uh, after a, a nice meal, there was yeah. the band was playing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, what, what, do you remember what happened then? Oh, so we, we got back to our hotel and Tom, Tom uh, there was a band playing and they were quite good. And Tom was like, yeah, yeah, tell them, tell them I can play the drums. Go and ask him if I can play the drums. And I was like, yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, sure, okay. So I went up to the band and I was like, excuse me, excuse me, my friend's really good at drumming. Please, can he play the drums with you? And they were just like, no, mate, no, no, I don't think so. And, then, and I was like, no, but honestly, honestly, really, he really can. And, you know, if you've, if and, you've and seen can, Tom... Is he, is he good at... He's amazing. Yeah, he's oh, amazing, he's, yeah. He's yeah, amazing yeah, he's, he's at really, all really instruments, yeah. He's a particularly good drummer uh, <laughs> and on top of other things. And they just, they shooed me away and said no. So I went up and said, I'm sorry, Tom, they won't let you play. He's like, oh, yeah, whatever, yeah. <laughs> but coming back to, um, coming back to, like, Tom's, like, the first time we saw Tom surf um, when we were down in Anglet and then travelling up to Moliette's, that first day he didn't surf. The second day we turned up. We had a we had a, a small itinerary, a couple of tasks that we were supposed to do. We were supposed to go and, and do some magazine interviews. I believe it was with Trip Surf at the time. And um, so we turned up at the at his apartment, picked him up, and we we're like, okay, Tom. So today we've got a little bit of work to do. We're gonna we need to go and do a, an interview with Trip Surf. And he went, mm, no, I'm not doing. <laughs> and we were like, oh, oh sorry, what? He's like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not keen. And we're like, oh, so oh, you've got Brad back in uh, in Wales on the other end of the line, and yeah, so we've we've got an official itinerary, or oh, but yeah. you know, we've got a certain amount of um, like promotional um, like duties that we're supposed to fulfil. And I, I just looked at Rhino, and Rhino just looked at me, and then both of us looked at Tom and said, "What do you want to do then?" He goes, "He goes, let's go surfing." And we're like, "That's a great idea, Tom. Let's go surfing. Not a problem." <laughs> so we went. We drove down to to Cavalier, and the same thing. Like the same thing. It's like it's huge. It's six to eight foot yeah. and on shore. And um, I'm just looking at it, just going, well, I, you know, I can't surf out there. It's, it's rubbish. And I, I, I mean, if you've spent a bit of time in, in the southwest of France, I don't surf when it's onshore. As soon, if it's like two miles an hour onshore, I just, I don't surf. Like it's offshore <laughs> so often and so good so often yeah. that you, you just don't surf like onshore waves. And it's so heavy when it's like that. And he, he's, he did spend years living in Cavalier, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. he lived just behind he, Cavalier. Yeah. 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 Just right there. So like, you know, that's, so he's seen it good. Yeah. He knows, oh, he knows what he, you know. He's got something to compare it to. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And we're standing there and I'm like ready to walk away. And we're like, Tom, you keen? He's like, yes, yes, I'm keen. <laughs> Let's get in there. And I'm like, oh, God, okay, uh, sure. 
So we go out there and um, we're sitting against the groin in Cavalier and I'm sitting, so he's sitting up against the rocks and Rhino and I are sitting a, a little bit further over, like on what we think is a left going into the, into the rocks. Like I can't catch a wave. Like I can't find a wave. I can't catch one. And then I turn and look at Tom and he's just turning on, on these six foot perfect right handers, which are just coming from nowhere and just surfing round in circles, like just blowing these right handers to bits and then paddling back out and taking another one and paddling back out. And I'm just like, bloody hell. You know, and then you've got all this thing of like, not only is it this person that I've, you know, I've had on my wall all my life and I've read mm. the stories about him, you know, paddling out into a lineup and all these perfect mm. waves coming to him. I'm witnessing it. And then I'm like, okay, great. Well, you know, if the waves are there, I'm going to paddle over there and I'm going to get some of those right handers. So like, he gets one and I paddle over there and just, just get nailed and just get close <laughs> outs on my head paddle back over to where I'm sitting and then he comes back out and just carries on surfing round in circles. It's, um, yeah, it was pretty, pretty mental. The first surf, I think Rhino mm. got a few, I think the whole time we surfed on the whole trip, my, my, my memory of my surfing was I pretty much couldn't surf and Rhino was getting some pretty good ones. And obviously Tom was ripping. And now correct me if I'm wrong. This is 2002. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. are actually the Welsh seniors champion at the time, aren't you? Jim? Yeah, it was the same year. Yeah. 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 So you're you're a Welsh champion. Yeah. And you and you're yeah. feeling like that. I'm feeling like a complete cook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's great. It's really really humbling experience. <laughs> so as as you track north, I remember surfing a peak. We won't name it. Just you know, one of the forest peaks a little bit north of Molliette. Yeah. And someone had told me that that was the spot that you guys had taken Karen to surf. Yeah, we and surfed that. That was a great bank that year. A really nice little bowly right hander. Yeah. Was it like that when you were there? No, we, we uh, <laughs> it was a, that was the day after, and so we went to we went to the same spot. Like I know what you're talking about. The same thing. It was like six to eight foot and howling on shore, <laughs> and then, and I'm like, oh, I, you know, oh, I I can't surf that again. Like I don't want to go out there again. And I'm like, there's no way he's going to go out there again, you know. And we're like, Tom, you keen? He's like, yes, yes, I'm keen. <laughs> let's, let's get in there. And I was like, oh, my God. And same thing, just, just, just getting waves, just, just surfing flawless rights and lefts that I, I couldn't see any. Rhino was getting a few. I just, it's just pretty mind-blowing, you know, w- watching him do what he does. Yeah. Uh, and it was this Molly X then, that's where the bar thing happened then. That was, the, yeah, yeah, that was at the Squirrel Hotel, wasn't it? And then that and was the, did, did he get to play with the band in the end? No. No, there was oh, they no... Just, they did shut him out. Yeah, no, totally. they just, they, yeah, totally. They had no, I didn't say, oh, by the way, it's so-and-so. I just said, oh, my friend over there, these guys weren't surfers. They had no idea. Um, yeah. yeah. Tom, I don't know what drummers look like, but he obviously didn't look like a drummer. They weren't interested. <laughs> he wasn't getting spotted in bars around that, around that area. We didn't go to even... any. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. So like, our whole, like the, the other discussion that we had was like, where are we going to stay? Like, were we going to stay in Hossegore or were we going to stay somewhere else? And I, the, the agreement was let's stay away from Hossegore. So then, so mm. that we keep that dynamic of we're just two normal blokes with yeah. some other normal bloke, just having a normal time, not being with him getting, cause in Hossegore this, you know, he's going to get recognized and, and yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So that was part of the idea was just to, to stay away from, you know, from anywhere where there might be that dynamic of him getting recognized as who he is. And, and then us two cooks hanging out with him or chaperoning <laughs> him uh, round and about the place. And then Jim, we, yeah, we were tracking North and the sort of objective was to get up to Brittany to Kiberon because at the end of the day, it was a kind of work trip, wasn't it? And uh, yeah. we were sort of doing some, uh, sort of work-related sort of visiting with Tom to do some signings and that. And of course, we got to Kiberon and um, where the local, I think, I believe it was the local surf team there had arranged a comp. Yeah, there was a, and, and we'd sponsored it. So yeah. we sponsored the comp, there was a, like a local competition on the, the Kiberon Peninsula. Realm had sponsored it. And then Brad had very kindly organized for um, you and I to surf in the expression session, which was amusing. But, but, so this club comp in Kiberon, though, have suddenly got Tom Curran like, hanging around their contest. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so Tom, Tom agreed. To, Tom was just hanging out. We got there and um, it was, you know, it's pretty relaxed up, on, up in Brittany. Um, it's, yeah. a, it's a really healthy surf scene, uh, similar to that in South Wales, if not bigger. Um, 
so the the first day we turned up the contest site was pretty busy and uh, the guys were like oh hey look you know the surf's terrible but if you drive like a few miles further down the peninsula there'll, there'll be really good waves at the the beach on the end so uh the same thing like you know our plan was always to make tom feel as comfortable as possible and mm. you know it was pretty obvious that he was extremely comfortable surfing you know amongst other things and we were like oh yeah cool you know, we'll go down the we'll go down the coast and surf so we got down to this beach that they told us to drive to there was no one out it was like four or five foot and and perfect so we, we paddled out had a had a pretty good surf and then um rhino and i were paddling back out together and i just turned around and i went oh look, look behind and the the empty beach that we, we were surfing there were now hundreds of people standing on the cliff watching us surf <laughs> and there were three of us in the water <laughs> yeah. that was amazing yeah it was pretty uh, that was like a our first sort of real because down in in Anglet and moliettes did you know there was no one around so you know we were just for us we were just hanging out with a, a new kind of mate or a new friend yeah surfing here and there and then suddenly we sort of turned around and it was like well they're certainly not here to see us as and in rhino all, and myself it's all starting to get more go more that way then as you get sort of nearer and nearer to to england really then is it yeah like everything like the you know everything st started to change a little bit like suddenly you know there's hundreds of people on the cliff watching watching him surf and it's like oh okay yeah so yeah this you can't compartmentalize or, or rationalize things in your head so we'd, we'd had our own little bubble down in the southwest and we're getting to know mm. each other and it's going really well and then sort of you know, everything becomes a bit normal there's just like three guys hanging out and surfing and you know drinking a beer and having food and stuff and then you see like you know a large crowd of people have come to see the same person surf and you're like oh you're kind of reminded yeah gosh it's you know, who it's that been. person is yeah yeah but it was still pretty you know it was still pretty low-key we went out for a quiet meal that night and then the next day the contest was really laid back and um, tom did some judging he judged a load of heats and he was just hanging out and talking to the groms all day so he was like mm. super relaxed rhino and I, rhino and i surfed the expression session i don't really do as uh, Rhino can do airs. I, I'm, I'm like the, did do airs. Did do airs. Uh, Without deck grips, I've been learning as well. This is uh, true. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I'm not well known <laughs> for doing airs, and the worst thing was that we kept on winning heats as well because we were, we were the we were the, <laughs> we, were the we were the brand sponsors of the contest and also on a promotional tour. Like the first heat, I was like, well, thank God, I've served the heat. I can go and. I can go and relax. So, like, so you're going to win your own product. Yeah, yeah. So we got both of us. <laughs> both of us got, I think, pushed through to the final. And then in the final, I was so embarrassed. There was a, there was one. The guy that ended up winning the contest was genuinely really, really good. I was yeah. like doing massive 360 airs and air reverses. And I was like, I can't, like, I've, I'm in the final. I'm very happy and I'm very grateful. But I started doing headstands on my surfboard to make sure that I, I didn't, you know, get it, get any higher than like last. Uh, ultimately, they gave they gave Rhino and I third and fourth place, and uh, the right. people that should have got first and second did. And then, yeah, we we won our own product, so Rhino and I gave it away to the Groms at the contest, which was nice. That's amazing. And then, and then you're on the ferry then, and it's like, you know, reality is coming your way now. You're going to be in Newquay in no time now, and uh, yeah, the same. level of interest in him is increasing the whole time. Yeah, the same on a family, like uh, it would obviously be in a surfing dad and like uh, his wife and their children, you know, we were, we were just getting out of the car on the ferry and walking up to the deck and they're like, they're, they were like, oh my God, and pointed and went, huh, it's Tom Curran. And the same <laughs> thing, it was like, oh, okay. You know, it's just all, all becoming a little bit more like or the reality of what was going on was sinking in a little bit. Yeah. And was it straight to Newquay once you got to England? Yeah, straight to Newquay. Uh, we went and checked into the North Shore Flats above Town. Um, yeah. and the surf was, the surf was pumping. Um, it was like really? big and southwesterly. So same thing. Our plan was, uh, I think we had two days where we could, um, we'd arrange just to go and do some photos. So the, the first yeah. day we went down to, um, down to St. Agnes. It's all right to say St. Agnes, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So we so. went to St. Agnes, which is like, you know, it's one of my favorite places to surf in Cornwall. Um, we explained to Tom that it's a pretty, you know, it can be a good hollow right-hander. It's, uh, we had like a fir our first experience of like, Tom's got a wicked sense of humor. Like he's, he's not quiet and he's not, when he's around people he's comfortable with, he's not quiet and he's not shy. He's really engaging. He's got yeah. a particularly sharp and pleasant sense of humor. And, uh, so he'd been down like the bottom of the boat ramp checking the surf. And then he, he came running up and he's like, come and check this out. Come and check this out. Like, oh my God, what is it? 
So he pulls us down to the boat ramp, and there's a, there's a boat there with uh, Norfolk and Charts written. It's the name of the boat. And he's, like, wetting himself, <laughs> laughing. He's like, <laughs> Norfolk and Charts. And I'm like... I, I, and I, I got, oh, right, I, I get it. You just yeah. got it. <laughs> yeah. Right, I get it. But yeah, I did, you I got did, to say it in, like, an Irish accent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, like, Tom, Tom's... I think Tom's got Irish roots. And um, he obviously had gotten this joke. And so he kept on saying it, Norfolk and Chance, Norfolk sharp. and Chance. And, like, I was going, I didn't get it at all. And he was laughing so much, I, I, I started laughing. I was like, yes, yes. <laughs> Great, great. <laughs> I, I didn't get the joke for about six years. About six years later, someone explained it to me. Oh, I saw it on television. <laughs> and then I thought back and I was like, oh, my Jack God. Do you the boat owners knew that? Of course, yeah. I think, oh, right, yeah, I think right. it's a convention in, uh, in boat ownership that it's actually a funny name. But yeah, it took me uh. years and years. <laughs> And I never admitted to anyone that that was the case. I was like, oh, yeah, it was great. Yeah. What so it? what's it like bumping into all the you know, people you know from, from Cornwall? And I think G- Guts was down there at one point, wasn't he? Wales is Guts Griffiths. And, and, and like everyone's like, oh, look, who have you got with you? That was and the, it's Tom Curran. Yeah, it was, that was the, like one of the first, you know, one of the most amusing things of the, of the, of the trip was just p- other people's reactions to, to A, hearing that what we were doing and then, you know, and then seeing the same person like standing with us just, you know. And everyone, Vino and I, you know, um, know a, a fair few people. And also, I think we've got a pretty good sense of humor. And half the time, I think people think, thought we were joking. And then, like, Tom would just, like, pop out from behind us. And they would be like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> so it was, like, that first surf in St. Agnes. We ran down the beach. And um, we were walking in the water. And uh, Guts Griffiths was there. And he's like, oh, hey, what's happening, boys? What are you doing? Oh, no, we said, oh, Guts, what are you doing? He goes, oh, yes. And he was, like, really proud. He's like, um... Yes, uh, I'm down here filming with the BBC. I'm filming a show um, called Faking It. Uh, it's great. Oh, with James Hendy. Yeah, with James Hendy. I remember that yeah. show, yeah. And, uh, and we were like, oh, that's really good. He says, what are you doing here? And we were like, oh, we're surfing with Tom Curran. And then Tom ran past him. <laughs> and Guts sprinted out into the lineup. And Guts just looked at us like completely crestfallen. He's like, oh, God. That's great. Hey, and can I clarify as well, when Tom went running past him, right? This was like May or June or something, wasn't it? And was, wasn't he surfing in a beanie and, so and he, gloves? He had, um, so when we were in France, like the, especially up in Brittany, like Tom was wearing, I think at the time he was wearing, um, what was he wearing? He was wearing our wetsuits, but he had some, some really terrible wetsuit accessories. So um, he was finding the water pretty cold. So he had these like huge oversized, like black, um, they were neoprene, but they looked like black marigold gloves. And he had a really badly fitting, like um, <laughs> terrible chin strap beanie. And Brad, yeah. like Brad had gotten wind that Tom was wearing these things in the water. And so you had Rhino and I on the phone and he's like, look, he goes, I'm paying a lot of money for the photographers and for the, the photographs of you guys on this tour. I can't use any of them if Tom is wearing a badly fitting beanie and <laughs> black marigold washing up gloves. And we were like, okay. And he goes, so if he puts them on, you tell him, you tell him to take them off. You tell him he's not allowed to wear them and he can't surf in them. <laughs> and of course we were like, oh yeah, okay, Brad, not a problem. So you've got to tell Tom Curran to wear an ice cream headache. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're like, okay, Brad, yeah, that's not a problem. And then we got off the phone and like Ryan looked at me and was like, are you going to tell him? I was like, no. And then <laughs> he goes, are you going to tell him? I said, no. And we were in the St. Agnes car park and like Tom's there, like, and he's, he's pulling on his marigolds and putting <laughs> Is really bad yeah. fitting beanie, and uh, yeah, like ran down the like. Ryan was like, "Go and tell him." I'm like, "I'm not telling him." Like, what? <laughs> who's going to tell him that? No, that's, it, it never happened. <laughs> that's brilliant. And that's are we in the area now? Of uh, our listeners in season one wanted to know more about this one. Rhino mentioned it so quickly when he was on the show last year, and uh, and and I I can't believe it didn't occur to me and Rob to ask a bit more about this. But was wasn't it was it in the St. Agnes area or Newquay that Curran invented, wrote a song about Rhino. Yes. This Rhino the Whale song. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty, so I've double checked this. Uh, it's a Len- I'm pretty sure it's a Leonard Cohen song and it's called, um, I believe it's called Jonah the Last White Whale is the original <laughs> version. Jonah the Last oh. White Whale. Oh, yeah. yeah, look this, I look that one up. Oh, lovely. Like a Moby Dick type reference. Pretty much, yeah. And, um, so we'd had, we were, it was in the North Shore Flats, and it is true, it's not an, an urban myth. We were, we'd surfed a lot, and we'd been out, for, I think we'd been out for an Indian, and we'd had a few beers, and um, we were sitting up, just, just hanging out, and uh, 
Tom constantly plays the guitar when he's not surfing, constantly. Um, like he'll it solo does, does along. Does that get a little bit like irritating? Um, no, it's not like the person that are, are like a, a house party that pulls out the acoustic guitar and starts yeah, singing. Yeah, I'm thinking of backpackers. Yeah, and clears the room. It's not. It's. Yeah. Um, I found it. I'm annoyed by those kind of people. Um, I also own a guitar. I've never really done that. But um, <laughs> uh, like Tom's a like. I think now certainly now it's more well known that he's a, a an extremely talented musician. So right. whenever you're sitting in the car, he'd just be soloing along to whatever music was playing on the stereo. And then yeah. when you're not playing or, you know, in the house and stuff, he's, he's playing his guitar, but he's, he's very, very good. So it's, it's actually really pleasant. Yeah. So he was playing. We, were, we, were, we would have had a few beers, that's for sure. There might have been some pretty bad singing going on. And then Tom started, <laughs> he'd swapped out the, the, the lyrics for the, this Leonard Cohen song. And he was singing a song about Rhino, the last white whale. It was great. <laughs> pretty surreal moment. I remember at the time, Rhino was... <laughs> Rhino and I were in one bed together, um, as you do, and Tom was in a, a single bed, and then Rhino was getting pretty tired, and he was starting to fall asleep, and I started like tugging him and like sh not shouting at him, but I was whispering at him really loudly, Rhino, Rhino, do not fall asleep. This is really important. This will never happen again. Don't fall asleep. He's like, oh, I can't. I've got to go. I'm so tired. I was like, you can't. You can't. Uh, yeah, it was good. And, and I, I was actually like those words stay with me because I was so glad that I did because and it's true and I think I might have mentioned it before I did this everlasting memory of looking up through the open window with all the lights off with a full moon behind him and Tom just strumming away on his guitar and I just thought yeah it's, that was it sounds really <laughs> homoerotic and really cheesy <laughs> but um and I'm I'm cringing as I'm saying it but it was so much fun. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, um, yeah, it's not an experience that's been repeated and probably won't. So I think yeah, it's good advice. Here at No Limit Wetsuits, a reputable company with 30 years' experience, we use the best neoprene on the planet. Guaranteed, perfect fit, full aftercare service should you need it. So whether you're from North Wales, West Wales, Pembrokeshire, or the rest of UK. Feel free to call me or check out nolimitwetsuit.co.uk. Greg Owen, Welsh surfing champ, eight times. And then um, you had to take him to the to the surf mag offices, and by now he's obviously going back into that kind of rock star mode because uh, I was told he was he, he turned up at either carve or wavelength with his sunglasses on indoors. Yeah, we had it's a couple of things. So we um, we went when we were still in Newquay. We, we, went to, we went to Pier and Surf and did like a poster signing and a meet and greet. And that went pretty well. Um, Mark at Pier and Surf is, is super laid back and his customers are, were really cool. That was all pretty straightforward. We then went and had breakfast at Pickwick's and the Wavelength guys turn up. And if, you, if you've been to Pickwick's in Pear and Porth, like it's got those little bench seats which are really close together. And so Tom was like, like wedged into one side of it with the guys from Wavelength and a microphone stuck in front of him. And then that was another like glimpse of, of the persona that's portrayed in the mainstream media where he kind of goes, you know, he's a little bit uncomfortable as you might be with a microphone stuck in your face. Yeah. So a couple of times, yeah, he would have put his sunglasses on indoors as yeah. a, a sort of, as a natural barrier or a kind of, well, out of whatever you call it, but he's just, he can be, you know, he's obviously got that, he's got that reputation from somewhere. I think he's a, a little bit shy in front of people that he doesn't know. And um, because of who he is and what he's done, he's often put in front of people, you know, that he doesn't really know and then asked quite searching questions. So, mm. yeah, that was, that was really interesting seeing him doing that. And we went to the carb offices. At the carb offices, um, the same thing, like the interview was booked and we went upstairs and he's like, uh, I'm just going to go to the toilet and like <laughs> disappeared for uh, quite a while. I think, he, <laughs> I think he went and checked the surf. Like, he was gone for a while. Like, you know, we didn't know where he was. Like, we couldn't find him. It was him. a good, like, good few hours, is not it? Oh, right. Yeah. We're not talking about, like, no, travel from the courier or anything. No, no. Was, no, no, it wasn't right. 20 no, minutes. No, he's was... gone. Like, he, and, yeah. <laughs> we, like, yeah, he disappeared. How, how did, how did, uh, was, was that with Chris Powell? Was it? That was Chris how, and how did he react? Steve England. And Steve, just yeah, waited. How did they yeah. react to that then? Just waited. And he ended up coming yeah. back. He came yeah. back and did the interview. And, and then we, <laughs> uh, we went home. We didn't ask him either. Yeah. No, it just uh, it, was, it was. I don't know. There's there's a certain level of understanding. Having witnessed him down in France say categorically that he didn't want to do an interview, 
you know, and he was really firm about that one. Um, yeah. And then seeing him with his glasses on, you know, in Pickwick's, that was the first time we'd seen him do that. And it was like, ah. Oh. And then that would have been either the same day or the next day at Carve. It was like, oh, well, look, you know, he's obviously not super comfortable doing that. So we're not, it's, I'm not going to say anything to him. Rhino isn't going to say anything to him. Mm. You know, I'm not even going to question him about it either. If that, you know, he's, he's all right. He's a big boy. We're not going to put him on the spot about it. You might not remember this, but you had actually agreed to, to let him do an interview with me for the Seaside News when he, when he showed back at me in Wales. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. And, uh, and I got in front of him and I was like, I'd, I'd had the memo from you guys, you know, that, that like, like don't, act up, you know, don't act up in any way because he's not going to like it. And I kind of took one look at him and I think I handed him a sheet of paper which had my questions on it yeah. and said, why don't you just write them down instead? <laughs> <laughs> it's like I've been, I'm in my third year of my degree <laughs> training as a journalist. <laughs> and um, he did, he wrote a few really, really crap answers and gave me this piece of paper back. Right. And then about two hours later said, can I have that back? Um, I don't like my answers. And I said, yeah, I gave it to him. And then he disappeared. That's and right. I never saw it again. Yeah. But then about a week later, you came back and you were like, oh, um, he did give me this just before he left, yeah. and it was the piece of paper, and he'd That's written right. some pretty amazing answers on it as yeah, well. Yeah. You know, it, like quite thoughtful stuff. Yeah, yeah. But it was it's, like it was never a spoken conversation. Nah, so, so it was like deep. you know, he did kind of. There must be some sort of sense of duty in him that, like you know, I was he was gonna, you know, he was gonna fulfil the obligation, you know, but he just on his terms, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so then we uh, forever tracking north this time on the A30, and uh, we sort of. Uh, our next de- destination was uh, was Bude yeah, to yeah. go and visit the guys uh, at the surf stores up there. Um, we went to see Barrier in Deep at the time. Yeah. Um, but um, the ripper of Bude at the time and still is actually was Mike Raven. Yeah. And uh, we, if you remember, descended on Mike's house, which was quite a story in itself, wasn't it? Well, it was um, that Mike had arranged for us to surf a, a lesser known spot somewhere close to Bude and we turned up in four vehicles a, a satellite dished a TV van a radio van it was um it was quite amusing we got to I'm close to saying the name of it so I've got to be, be careful not to we got to the beach or the the parking the spot left-hander. it was a left-hander yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um so we get there and uh you know I'm asking I think I asked Mike I said like, oh Mike can you uh, can you explain to us uh, you know how we get how do we get down and how do we get in the water? And uh, so, you know, we can, we can let Tom know what to do. So like M- M- Mike's giving us this detailed description of, oh, well, you need to pick your way down there and walk out there. And then we turn around to speak to Tom and like, we're like, where is he? And like, he's like halfway up the cliff, like up to our left with a, his wetsuit and a bin bag. And we're like, hey, what are you doing? And he's just like head down and gone. So we're like, we're like oh, well, you know, We'll just we'll just let him get on with it. So we start making our way down the cliff, and by the time we got to the lineup, he was already out, changed out in the lineup and surfing. We're just from there. <laughs> oh, that's that. Yeah, that, he's famous for that. You know. And that's the thing. It was it, it was so unassuming as well because yeah. like everywhere he sort of went, it was no fanfare. The wetsuit was in a black bag or a little like bag, like yeah. shopping bag and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. Really cool. And. So England next up is Wales. Even more of a circus by then, wasn't it? Uh, now, yeah. Now, like this, you know, things are just getting busier and busier. Um, the the great thing was that we were as a you know as a as a as three people together. We're getting closer and closer. You know, we spent like um, I think by this stage stage we've been with like all together for you know for two weeks solid and twenty four hours a day. So yeah, like we, the same thing was happening up in um, in South Wales. We had some some shop uh, like promo signings to do. And, and he surfed Langland though, didn't he? Then we went to Langland. Langland shore break was was pumping. Um, uh, it was it was like four foot, um, m- maybe a bit bigger. I think it was westerly or northwesterly, which is good conditions for Langland. Yeah. And then Tom actually said to me, he's like. Like I was really hoping that he'd ask Rhino or myself to borrow any one of our boards that we had. And we took a lot of boards with us. At the time, we were both riding JPs. And um, at that point, we hadn't managed, he hadn't asked to borrow our boards and we hadn't managed to pluck up the courage to ask him if he wanted to try. And uh, he just came up to me. I had, a, I had one of JP's um, original like keel fished or wooden keel fished fishes. I remember that board. Yeah. Yeah. And he, yeah, I had to go over it in low tide fresh one day. It was a lovely it. board. Amazing, yeah. yeah. 
And uh, so Tom, he, he comes up to me and he's like, oh, hey, um, can I borrow that fish? And I'm like, of course you can. Yeah. So uh, I gave him the fish and like off he went like and uh, started like putting some wax on it. And then I looked over my shoulder in the slip roads just to check that he was okay. And uh, I saw him, he, he got a, <laughs> he got a fin key and he was undoing the, the screws in that had like a, a little, um, a little nubster fin in the back. And I was like, oh, oh hang on. So I walked over and I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, oh, hey, Tom, I think you'll find that it goes really, really well with the half fin. And then I realized what I was saying and to whom I was saying it. And then he turned around <laughs> and just looked at me and smiled. And I went, yeah, yeah, no worries. No worries. You do I'll what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so while he's... See so surfing at Langland, but you guys are staying uh, in Porth Call still, is it? And I think it's that surfing Langland was the day before the, yep. the Sunday. And then this is another bit, of very small part of the story that I remember because I was working in the surf shop double overhead for the sign in the next That's day. It. I was I was the guy behind the counter. So he tell, he's not liking me. He's like, I've stuck an interview <laughs> sheet in his face. <laughs> and then the next day, I'm the counter of the surf shop where he's got to sign posters for all these groms. Yeah. But you've, you, you, this is where the no photo rule gets broken obviously like we would have been dying to have our photo taken with him you know yeah absolutely we uh, but, uh, i, we I think i was yeah like the agreement was we were never you know between the three of us gonna say hey let's have a photo here let's have a photo there yeah and then at that point um you know brad wanted to have a brad wanted to have a photo with tom because you know he hadn't seen him yet and brad was paying for the whole thing um and at that point you know brad was paying his salary as well so you know, there was a, a, a call to have some photos taken outside the double overhead surf shop. Yeah. So the, the one photo that uh, Rhino and I had taken with him was taken outside double overhead. So it's Rhino, Brad, uh, one of the twins, Connor, or I don't know which one it would have been, uh, myself yeah. in a photo. Uh, and that's the, yeah, it's the one single time that we had a photo taken, taken with him. It's pretty funny. We're, we're laughing. Like it's, it's a nice yeah. photo. There's some genuine it's, laughing going it's on. It's a friendship photo. I, and I did learn that the person, I didn't know this, but the, t the person who took the photograph is sitting next to me. Yeah. Oh, I <laughs> found that out me. the other day. Yeah, I, did, I have I, no I, idea. Yeah. It was me. Yeah, because we've got, we got uh, the next, you know, then we took one of, uh, of Breege's brother with him. Um, he was like 10 at the time or something, or 11. And then, uh, and then they were like, oh, do you want one? And I said, no, because I was trying to be all authentic and I was feeling too guilty about it. <laughs> and I'd heard your story about don't have your photo. And I was like, no. So, uh, yeah, that's it. You'll just have to believe that I stood anywhere near him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that pretty much sort of sewed up the trip, really, didn't it? For That was it. As, as, as far as, well, for me anyway, as far, this is where I sort of stepped off that sort of uh, a train, as it were. But, uh, but for you, the story of Tom Curran went on fairly spectacularly in the sort of same sort of vein as it had already since we had been with him. Yeah, I suppose in a way, this is only the beginning, really, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Kind of. Like, <clears throat> like as far as my, uh, like our mentality on, on that two-week trip was, as I was trying to explain to Rhino when he was falling asleep, is that, look, this is probably never going to happen again, so let's try and... You know, let's really enjoy it. Let's not fall asleep. Let's try and experience, you know, all that we can and, and you, know, you know, stay awake the whole time. And, you know, it's, it's likely not to repeat itself. Um, Tom headed down to, down to Spain with Brad and Scove. Um, and at that point, I was, both of us were sort of thinking, oh, well, that's that. We'd exchange phone numbers and stuff. Um, but I had no idea what would, what would happen next. I moved, that was the summer, I moved down to France to work for Realm in France. So I moved to Bourdain's in Senyos. Um, I think I sent him a, a couple of text messages, which I obviously didn't get any reply. Um, I've never had a single reply. I've sent, like, I can't hide it. I've sent Tom plenty of emails over, the, or <laughs> certainly back in the day, like plenty of emails, plenty of text messages. Hasn't ever replied. I message him on Instagram, never replies. <laughs> so at that point, yeah, I was sort of thought that all of that was was over um, until one day I was like my, one of my neighbors in Bourdain's was Stephen Bell or Belly from Euroglass. I was around his house chatting and he's like, uh, oh, I hear Tom Curran's coming to stay at your house. I was like, oh, I, I don't think so. He goes, yeah, he goes, yeah, yeah, I've heard, I've heard he's going to come stay with you. And I was like, wow, 
I said, I, I honestly don't know anything about it. And he goes, and like, he sort of seemed to almost seem quite annoyed that I was either lying to him or trying to hide something from him. And I genuinely had no idea what he was talking about. And then a few days later, like um, a few weeks before the, like the season was starting to wind up for the WQS contest in, in Europe. And um, one evening there's a knock on my door and I go and open it. And Tom's standing there with his board bag and his, uh, his realm <laughs> wheelie bag, which was pretty beaten up and only had one wheel on it. And he's like, hey, hey, Jim. He goes, hey, Jim, can I stay? And I'm like, fuck, yeah, fucking come in. <laughs> so that was like the he turned up and he was in he was in France for for the three or two, two and a half, three months of the WQS and WCT season. Um, well, and all of this at your house. Yeah, all at my house in Bourdain, yeah, <laughs> unannounced. <laughs> Sleeping upstairs in the in the mezzanine, like in my tiny one bed little house, it was amazing. <laughs> and, he, and and he said that um, he turned up with the one wheel realm bag and he's yeah. got like his board bag. Like, did you have managed to have a quick look inside what was? Oh in the yeah, board? like you know, but that I think I was. It would only been like a couple of months since we'd seen him in Porthcawl, and um, you know, she turned up and it was all as you. I don't know, like um sometimes I'm good at keeping in touch with people and sometimes I'm terrible at keeping in touch with people. And with some of my best friends, I don't speak to them for months, stroke nearly years, but there's that convention where, you know, the, they say some of the closest friendships, you don't need, you know, you don't need any contact. And when yeah. someone turns up, you just pick right up where you left off. And like, I mm. definitely, at that yeah. point, I definitely felt like that. So yeah, he turned up and he's like, you know, he's unpacking his stuff. Well, he'd been there for a couple of days and then, um, you know, we'd had a few surfs and then like he starts one morning, he's uh, unpacking his quiver bag. And uh, so I'm like, you know, I just get in his bag and I'm pulling out his boards and looking at them. His boards are terrible. You know, he's got, he's got. Is, like, is that always a thing? Um, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. Like he, his boards, the boards he had when we were in, in France, Wales and Cornwall were, were really awful looking to, to Ryan or myself. And like his, most of the time back in the day, like he'd be riding really retro looking like six two six ones, six twos, six threes, six mm. sixes, black widows, but the really retro yeah. looking things, like quite pulled in pintails, loads of V, like boxy rails, like horrible. You, you're things. giving me um, a memory of, or I'm guessing the year as like ninety two maybe, and I'm just remembering he was probably like the first person to really um, sort of put like high performance shortboard surfing onto retro boards, wasn't he? You know, like the fireball fish stuff in yeah. that movie, Feral Kingdom was a little bit later than this. But the first, is it true the first anyone in the surf world knew about it was when he walked down the beach for a heat against Matt Hoy, yeah. like two foot horse ago. That's it, yeah. And he had one of those under his arm and he had his normal thruster and then he suddenly at the last minute with no leash just ran out on the, on the twinny and beat Matt Hoy. I think, someone, I think someone, was, someone was sitting down the beach with the twinny and was sort of hiding it and he walked down with his normal board under his arm and picked up this fish and then ran out and surfed it. And Hoyo tells the, like Matt Hoy tells it the best, like Matt Hoy was like trying his hardest and would have been like the fittest and surfing the best that he had yeah. during his whole career. Yeah, yeah. And then Curran runs out on like some comedy surfboard and just blitzed him. He <laughs> <laughs> just said it's the most embarrassing thing ever. It was like a really yeah. tight little bank, two foot, slightly, yeah. slightly too high, closing out, bit of backwash running through it and Curran yeah. just smoked him. Yeah, just it, like impossible to surf. It was, um, it was interesting. Like he turned up at that point, like he was riding pretty stock sort of shortboards. There was nothing, right. there was nothing fancy in his quiver bag. But like I was going through it that, that morning, like I was going through his bag and putting out his boards and like all, you know, peeling, like all his boards have got Irish wax jobs, like wax on the underneath, all his <laughs> yeah. sponsor stickers. I was going to ask that. He doesn't clean the wax. No, on the hand, no, does he? no. Wax on both <laughs> sides doesn't care. And like, He's got like, he had a couple of zip ties for leash strings and I was cutting those off like a, like a fussy like grandmother trying to untie, <laughs> tying him on nice leash strings and stuff. But one of the most interesting things like with, a, with his boards and stuff, I, out the bottom of his board bag, like I pulled out um, a K board, like it would have been at the time a, a 511 Swallowtailed, like Kelly Slater model, Al Merrick. And uh, yeah. I'm like, wow. I said, hey, you know, and it actually looked really nice, like nice foiled rails and a, you know, a bit more volume in the middle. I'm like, wow, yeah. this thing looks really nice. And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, this one's really good. And I'm like, oh, cool. I said, you know, and he goes, ah, oh. he goes, yeah, okay, I, I'll surf this today. And I'm like, oh, wow, okay, great. You know, he's going to surf like a decent surfboard. So then he, he put some fins in it 
um, and then picks it up and like puts the nose in the grass and then grabs the fins and he looks at me and he goes, okay, let's see how difficult I can make this for myself. Uh, I was just looking at him going, uh, okay. And then just like push the fins in as hard as he could until the fin box is cracked and then let him go. <laughs> and then looked at me like really happy with himself. <laughs> And then, like, pick the board up, and it's like, okay, let's go. So then we he, we go down the beach, and it's like, you know, it's head high and super fun. And he, I reckon, he surfed thirty percent better on like that modern shaped surfboard, even though he'd cracked the fin boxes on it. <laughs> cracked the fins <laughs> than, I, than I've ever seen him surf, you know, on anything else. It's um, <laughs> wow. yeah, just just mental. It was pretty interesting. Like we come back and finish like messing around with his boards, and then. Yeah, it's like another moment. He's he's like, oh, do you mind if I put him in your rack? And I'm like, no, there's plenty of room. So he goes ahead and puts all his black black beauties or black widows, the black beauties in my board rack with a keyboard, and I'm just sitting there, sort of feeling pretty happy with myself. I'm like, okay, yeah. Well, so this this thing's continuing. You know, here he is. My God, he's staying mm -hmm. in my house. His boards are in my rack. So yeah, it was a pretty pretty nice pretty nice sort of feeling. And a, yeah, and he surfs a lot then. That's uh, that's one of the things I'm loving about this story is is just I love just, I I get from you how much I mean I know you surf a lot Jim I I get that you know he he really does love surfing then and you know this is sort of a while now after um the, the absolutely you know, like world title heyday of his career and he's just he like through and through I asked him like so like our routine in France was really simple it was just surf eat surf eat surf eat and then sleep. And then I asked him one day, I was like, what's your, like, what, cause it's, it's obvious that like, he doesn't, he's not, not like an occasional surfer, you know, like it, it's a full time. When I say a full time occupation, regardless of whether, and I think everyone knows this, regardless of whether he's getting paid or not, it's a full time occupation for him. Or it certainly was at that stage. You know, mm. I think as people get older, you're, you know, the, the tide of adrenaline goes out slightly and your desire to, to surf for, for that amount of time every single day may wane. But certainly at the time, I was like, what's your, you know, what's your minimum like per day that you want to surf? And like, he just came back like, like straight away, he's like four hours, four hours minimum. Wow. And I'm like, four hours? He goes, yeah, I need to practice for four hours. And he said, like, he used the word practice as well. It's like, I need to practice at least for four hours a day, you know, in order to maintain the level that I want to maintain. So it's just, it's not haphazard, you know, he's, it's so interesting. I think there's a thing, one of the like underwriting things with Tom is that his, his on land persona is one, you know, it's outward persona is one of being perhaps laid back and, you know, a bit haphazard, maybe a bit random um, and a bit lackadaisical. But as far as his surfing goes, the, the, you know, there is nothing haphazard and nothing lackadaisical about it. You know, mm. there's a, there's a, a burning like laser beam focus within mm. him when it comes to surfing. Yeah, you mentioned earlier the when he went to win the world title from the trials, which is the equivalent of, of winning a world title today like, uh, by first surfing all the WQSs and, and then surfing yeah. the CTs. Yeah. And like, having seen him like surf, you know, well, surf with him and watched him surf live and spoken to him about it, you know, it's just, it's just it's absolutely not surprising. You know, there is a, a burning desire within him to, to surf every single wave possible without getting in anyone else's way, by the way, um, unlike some, some other guys, um, to surf every surfable wave possible and to leave nothing on the table when he surfs mm -hmm. a wave. You know, and then I think once, once I sort of worked that out in my head and then subsequently when you watch like, you know, footage from him from, from any time, you, then you suddenly realize that there's a, there's like a juxtaposition between his online, sorry, his on land, you know, persona and, and how he behaves and how he surfs in the water. It's amazing. It's just, it, mm. you know, anytime you've, you've ever watched uh, or seen pro surfer surf for the first time, an elite level surfer, you know, the difference is like the difference between a Formula One racing car and, the, uh, you know, a normal road car. You know, the, mm. the speed, agility and precision is just, is just night and day different. Mm. And that laser focus that he had and the level he was at actually when he was actually with you as well uh down when he was staying with you in Bourdain he was actually entering a comp at this while he was staying there well, which, yeah. what comp was that 
So there was the, you know, um, back in the day, or I think it, uh, it would, would have been the Rip Curl Pro, you know, the initial CT contest, which was in the middle of summer, had then become a QS contest, which was the Rip yeah. Curl Pro. Yeah, they so, used to have the Lacano, Hossego, Biritz trio, wasn't it? it? And it, yeah. yeah, they all became like six stars, didn't they? That's it. So mm. at the time, um, so he'd, you know, he was, he, was, he was surfing more and surfing more in the public eye. And then he'd done, he'd done a few contests in, um, in Europe. And so that first summer, like he was surfing the Rip Curl Pro and he was a few heats away from requalifying. Mm. Right, yeah. So he'd like, I think he got to the, he got to the quarters and, um, and everyone started, you know, people started being like doing the maths and they were like, bloody hell, like if he, you know, if he wins this contest or he makes the final, he's going to requalify for the tour. And, um, the WCT. For the WCT. And then, so I think it was one of the quarters. It was the year that Travis Logie won the event. And in the quarter, right. like the contest bank was, you know, the, the contest bank was straight out from the judging tower. And then for his quarterfinal heat, he jumped in the water further up the beach and just paddled north and just away from the judging the tower. Pretty much paddled. Yeah. I, well, I, don't, I never asked him why he did it, but I was stood there with, his, with Mackie, with his wife. And he paddled out of the contest or, you know, just paddled to the north extremity of the, of the contest area and sat there, didn't catch a wave for 20 minutes and then came in and, and that was the end of it. It was bizarre. Wow. Yeah. That is incredible. Yeah. And did, was he disappointed when he came in or? Um, I didn't, it, I actually, I found it so strange that he'd done it just because he was effortlessly like getting through heats. Um, yeah. He'd obviously done it for a reason and I didn't ask him. I wasn't, I just, I wasn't interested. Yeah, wow. I don't think he like he didn't particularly care. Um, I think at that stage he was already thirty-seven. Yeah, yeah, you know. But it was just really interesting that you know with a, with a few contest appear, uh, appearances and a few contest results, he was on the cusp of requalifying. It show it shows the standard that he continued surfing at. Oh, for sure. Um, Still you know, does. Yeah, well into yeah. yeah. It was um, at that contest, like so, just after he came out of the water for for his quarter. Um, and then we're hanging out and uh, watching the, the semis and the finals. Then after the finals, there was a tag team event. And um, right. so Travis Logie, uh, that's mates with Tom, he, he'd won the event. And uh, he was looking to, to get a tag team together to, to surf. That's like a yeah. fun thing um, after the contest had finished. And so he came up and he asked Tom if he would surf in his team. And then went off and was, was looking for some other people. And then Tom sort of like was looking around and he's like oh i need i need one more guy for for a tag team and i was like oh, oh yeah i'm like okay oh, oh. i'm like what well seniors champion what? i'm like okay tom i didn't i didn't yeah. say anything i was like okay tom so what are you looking for a, for a surfer to to surf in your tag team <laughs> well, like like someone who can surf that you know someone who's available to surf right now here, <laughs> right right here today and he's like yeah yeah and i'm like oh Okay, and I'm, like, I'm genuinely thinking and stressed a little bit. I was like, my God, he's going to ask me if I want to surf in a tag team event with a whole load of like WQS surfers. I'm like, Tom, who, who do you want to surf? And he goes, oh, Mark Phipps. Mark Phipps, <laughs> he surfs really good. He just lives just around the corner. Let's go and find him. I'm like, yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, Mark. Yeah, Mark does surf really good, doesn't he? Yeah, let's go and find him. <laughs> uh, so. Oh, yeah. that's great. That's really cool. And and then, you know, the whole time as well, he's he's sort of uh, associating himself with, besides you, he's got like, um, you know, most of his other surf um, partners are like former world champions, former world runners up. Um, you know, that, that's the kind of... Um, and, and so that means that he's sort of bringing these people sort of through your house, you know, like in the same way as like your son will be bringing his mates back yeah. when he's in his teens, you know? Yeah, I had um, I had a morning like... I would, I always get up pretty early. So I'd get up in the dark and go and check the surf and usually surf, I'd get a surf in really early. And I got back to the house one morning and walked through my gate and there was Tom, Martin Potter, uh, Robbie Page. Um, I think Elko was there as well, just sitting on my, my, on my bench in my garden, standing up on the grass, just chatting. And I'm like, oh, hi, morning. <laughs> hi, boys. Going. Yeah, they um, they were going filming with with Greg Martin, a friend of mine from Friday Productions, and nice. uh, yeah, that was pretty surreal. And then there was um, even like the first time when we, were, I think we it was the second day in in France, and we were driving back up to his apartment, and we drove past Martin Potter, who was living in Biarritz at the time, 
And Tom's like, hey, hey, look, there's pots, there's pots. And he's like, hey, you guys know pots, don't you? And Rhino and I were like, no, sorry, Tom. No, we, we, we don't know pots. No, <laughs> Martin Potter. He said, he You're said the it, only world champion that we know. For. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He said, it with, he said it about Kelly as well. Like he started talking about Kelly for some reason. And then he, he turned to both of us. He's like, yeah, you know, you guys know Kelly, don't you? And we're like, no, 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 Tom. <laughs> we don't know Kelly Slater either. And, uh, and then he said it, and he said it with and, about Andy Irons too. He's like, we we're talking about Andy. They've been on some trip together. And uh, he's like, yeah, you know, you guys, you guys know Andy? Andy, you know him? You know Andy? And we're like, no, no, Tom, no, we don't know Andy either. No, we don't know any of those guys. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's always pretty surreal. Uh, but, and also like a, a very nice moment. Fortunately, I actually knew at that stage, I'd, I'd met Potts and I knew Pagey because he had the bar around the corner and um, yeah. I'd got to know Elko a tiny bit. So it wasn't quite so embarrassing and awkward, but um, it's still pretty surreal. And you got to see um, his kids as they progressed to surfers and Leanne in yeah. particular, you know, became oh, a wonderful. Like, like Leanne and, and Nathan. So there is um, his French children. Uh, they stayed with us um, quite a lot over the, the first summer in Bourdain's. At that stage, they would have been I, I like between 12 and 14, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's bizarre. So first of all, they both of them look a lot like their dad, which is mm. pretty stranger than itself. And at that stage, like, you know, I wasn't a father nor had any paternal feelings. But I can remember just looking at the, the dynamic between the three of them and just thinking, my God, you know, this is this is pretty cool. So mm. both of them, Leanne and Nathan, surf exactly like their dad, exactly like their dad. They've got the same bottom turn. They've got the same hand placement. They do the same top turns. They arch mm. their back and like everything is identical. But Leanne serves like just like Tom in, in exactly how he serves. And Nathan yeah. at that stage was surfing just like Tom, but doing air 360s. So it's like mm. watching a, a 14 year old like Tom doing air 360s is just bizarre. Do you think that's nature or nurture? Has he had a lot to do with sort of teaching them to surf and, and you know, passed on tips to them? I think it's both. I think, um, I just, I think it's, it's got to be genetic, some of it. I mean, they've obviously yeah. spent a heap of time together. And, you know, I mean, if there's, if there's possibly a, the best surfing dad in, you know, to have, then that he might be it or he might be that person. But um, I think some of it's genetic. There's a, there's a really interesting French saying, um, which is like the translation is uh, dogs don't make cats. So meaning, yeah. you know, uh, if a dog has babies, it doesn't produce a cat. It produces a mm. dog because mm, Nathan, yeah. when the surf's pumping, like he, he lives in, in Biarritz or Anglet. Sometimes when the surf's pumping, he'll come up and surf the, you know, the beach breaks up here as Tom used to do when, when he was younger. And um, he doesn't come up very often, but when he does, he always gets shots of him like charging huge barrels and his yeah. posture and his style and positioning is just, you know, it's, it's flawless, flawless yeah. Tom Cohen. I think some of that's genetic. And in true to form Tom Cohen style gem, like Tom Cohen would disappear from your house yeah. like, for the entire winter. Yeah. And then as magically as he disappeared he reappears again back at your house yeah yeah that so yeah i would he disappear and i would always as you and i did i would just think okay well that's it you know all right so it, it's lasted a bit longer wow fantastic and then <laughs> yeah just expect never to you know never to hear from him again and then i would i like out of pride i wouldn't email him for a few months and then I'd be like, oh, I, I just really want to, you know, I want to get in contact with him. <laughs> so I'd email him and, and with no reply. And I'd just be like, oh, God, OK, well, all right, that, then, that's that then. OK, well, hey, it was great fun. And then the next summer, same thing again. He'd turn up completely unannounced. Just uh, turn up one evening randomly. Can I come and stay? But yeah, please come, come on in. Your, your bed's, bed's ready. Put your boards in the rack. <laughs> yeah. It was great. Yeah, so he turned up. All in all, he, he stayed for, for three summers. So two summers in my, my house in Bourdain's. And then I moved from that property to, I moved into a, a friend's house in Senos. And then he, he turned up there too. Wow. Uh, the routine would be the same. Um, you know, just surf, eat and sleep. Um, I, we never once like went out to a, it's not Tom's thing, but we just, you know, purposely would just hang at the house, not go to any bars, never really went to any restaurants, just hung at the house, took it easy and surfed all day. And then 
he's been he keeps staying at your place but in the end didn't like the sort of uh the the surf industry yeah. like they got rise involved. up to it and go hang on we need to move him to a hotel <laughs> yeah like he um so rip curl became interested in him um the second summer i was there and i think they he turned up at bells that year and surfed um not sponsored by rip curl and i think uh the initial conversations about getting him back on board started there so then um just after he turned up at my place in summer it was announced that he would be uh, sponsored by rip curl but for eyewear and footwear and then right. after about a month uh, the rip curl guys found out where i was living and they came and picked him up and took him from my house and put him up in the mercedes which is like a really nice five-star hotel yeah. in Hossegor the one Center. just by the bridge yeah the one yeah. just by the bridge and like the same yeah. thing i was just like Okay, well, um, you know, that, that's the end of that. You know, probably won't see him again or won't hear from him again. And then the mm. next morning, um, there was a knock on my door and it's him and he's like, right, let's go surfing. Wow. So, which yeah. was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, yeah, because I'm getting the picture that, you know, it's kind of that sort of, um, he's seeing through like, you know, some elements of the industry, you know, and, and you know, that, that, there's obviously, uh, you know, a, a real he he values and sort of cherishes like real people being themselves. Uh, mm. you know, he we probably were, doesn't get to experience it that much. I don't, yeah, you know, I don't think so. And I, I hope that was always oh, this, like, as Ryan and I said, that was always our strategy. You know, there was very little pressure from Realm or from Double Overhead, yeah. like his main sponsors. All, all we wanted him to do was be happy and to surf and you know wear our clothing and put our stickers on his boards. So. And and from there, then he's ended up. He has ended up back. Um, you know, with Rip Curl as his umbrella sponsor. Um, you know, and he and he's he's popped up here and there in 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 surf. You know, in the surf world to do these amazing things. You know, smoking Oki at J Bay in that veterans heat. Yeah. And that 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 barrel. Um, and and he he's obviously got some sort of particularly special uh, role on Rip Curl's roster because he seems to have been the only Rip Curl rider who appeared to have been exempted from, from making that really sort of cut and pasted contrived Instagram announcement. You remember when they all, when they all pasted, we are, Fletch has just told me that Rip Curl had about to sponsor the WSL finals and it kind of ended up looking like, you know, Fletch has just told me to tell you that Fletch has just told me. And, and Curran seemed to be out while all of this is going on. Um, Curran, I'm, I'm not sure where he is as we speak, but I would, ho I would love the thought that he's still down there in Selena Cruz. Just on those yeah. Mexican right-handers, mm. um, you know, and 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 the free scrubber drops, yeah. you know, early in 2021. And it just, you know, captured my amount. Like, it was like the joy I felt watching, you know, the first Search movie and, you know, his yeah. rides at J-Bay there, mm. just the, 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 the surfing, the pleasure... And the music, you know, him playing his music, and I'm watching it all, and I'm and I'm realizing like this is the experience Jem has had, you know, this guy sitting around, pootling around with his music and surfing the whole time. You've you've seen Free Scrubber, I take it, Jem? Yeah, I saw it. I I watched it, and um, like I'm sure this will sound incredibly cringeworthy, but I watched it, and I texted I texted Rhino, and I just I said, look, you've got to watch this, and I, my comment was, it just made me feel really happy. Yeah, yeah, you know, Jem, you. You know um, Tom Curran's surfing really well because you've managed to see it, you know, and, and, and obviously we all know Tom Curran's surfing really well through video, but you've been in the water, you know, behind waves, across waves, under waves, and, and, and you know, behind him as he bottom turns, duck diving, all those positions that you get to be in that, you know, you see, you know, that, that kind of intimacy with which you get to know someone surfing. And... I'm fascinated by just some observations, you know, you sent me ahead of this, you know, your observations on Tom's surfing. And I just wanted to sort of check, check you through a couple of these because there's some amazing comments here, Jem. You know, you're saying, you've said this already, nothing laid back about it. No. Um, you know, he's, he's tearing every wave to pieces. He catches a lot of waves, you're saying, um, but he's not, he's not sort of, he doesn't irritate the crowd. You know, he doesn't, he's not a bully. There's, um, so there's a few a few of the boys around here have obviously surfed with a lot of the elite level surfers and there's um there's a couple of people you know they're like oh yeah you know i, I went for a surf with so and so and it was an absolute nightmare the yeah. guy dropped in on everyone in the water yeah. like paddled yeah. for every wave that everyone you know, that anyone else was paddling yeah. for he'd paddle for it um yeah. you know was in a real rush and was was really unpleasant to surf with 
Tom, like Tom's just like an absolute dream to surf with. It, he catches the first thing he catches a lot of waves. I don't think I've ever seen anyone like catch as many waves as he does. And it right. doesn't, you know, whether you think the surf's good or bad, or the surf is good or bad, whether it's big, yeah. small, whether it's hollow, yeah. whether it's not hollow, he just catches a lot of waves. Yeah. And and you say here, his face is completely free of any sign of effort. Yeah, like you watch, you watch what he's doing, and he's surfing so quickly and so precisely, and it's like the the fourth surf of the day. You know, it's hour number six in the water. And it's, you know, it's hour number two of the session and it's wave number 30. And there's just, and with the mechanics of what he's doing, which is like just tearing the bag out of mm. anything that he's surfing. And then his face is, I always think of it, um, the song that I imagine in my mind is like that song, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, which is a really yeah. f- flowery, you know, yeah. <laughs> beautiful, soft song. There's just nothing, yeah. there's no grimace or there's no, you know, emotion or there's no taut skin on his face. It's just like completely mm. screensaver face, just <laughs> flying along, tearing it to and pieces. Lastly, this one, again, perhaps sort of underrated nowadays, as you know, Curran's in his 50s, mid 50s, and, and you know, um, he, that he, he charges. You know, you, you mentioned here, you know, um, his father, Pat, was yeah. a big wave surfer. He's obviously spent time on the North Shore. You know, For he, sure. he's, he's a backdoor specialist. I just think um, I just think at the time, like it was, it was relatively unknown. But like the, my experience is, you know, the bigger and the heavier the waves are, the more excited he is to surf. He's excited really? to surf all the time, but like yeah. when it's when it's you know, when it's big and when it's heavy and when it's hollow, like he gets, he's twice as excited and twice as motivated. Yeah. So that that third summer that he spent in in Hostegor with me. Like at that point, then his sponsorship with the realm was ending and his like full umbrella sponsorship with Ripkill was kind of taking over. And then he left Hosogor and went straight to Hawaii and he got the cover shot um, on Surf Europe of him at Backdoor. And it's huge. It's like, you know, it's as big as Backdoor gets. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's, it, it's the same thing. He's in a huge Backdoor barrel and that with just zero emotion and zero effort you know no signs of stress on his face and yeah. it's uh, it's it's pumping and if there was ever like a, a a magical time that you could have spent with tom gem um like out of the water the one time i think that, that I, I discussed with you um you told me about the time that you ended up watching the J bay contest with kelly and andy actually with tom uh, over the uh, uh, by on your laptop yeah like you know you you hear all the so you hear the stories about you know him being in finals and you know waves coming to him and you know yeah him needing a nine like at margaret river i think is in the final against luke egan he needed a like a high nine and he got a high nine and you know he's done that several times and you know whenever you sit in the the water with him like all the best what he catches all the best waves like if you want to say all the best waves go to him then you know that then Maybe that's a, do, that's yeah. a truism mm. and mm. people over the years have said in the same way they say it about kelly now that you know he's got like an extra level or an extra depth of connection with the ocean or whatever it is like having surfed with him like live and you know watched him surf like it's definitely true there's something going on there whatever it is, like people say it, like in all sorts of sports, you know, the more I practice, the luckier I get. You know, Tom mm-hmm. surfs an awful lot and yeah. has surfed an awful lot, but my gosh, like, you know, the, he, he knows which, which, waves are, which waves are coming and when they're coming. So we sat down, like I witnessed this, like uh, again, we sat like watching the, the, the J-Bay final, Andy versus Kelly. 2005. Uh, 2005, we're just yeah. watching it on my laptop. And um, so... Uh, Andy's had a like Andy's had a pretty good wave and is, thinks he's won the heat and he's on the sand and he's also claiming it. Um, yeah. The buzzer is starting to count down, like the the sea or the ocean's pretty much flat, and uh, they start counting Kelly down and it goes really quiet, and then you, you can't see anything on the horizon on the screen. And uh, Tom just looks at me and he goes, "Oh, there's one coming." And uh, I'm like, okay, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I got chills, man. Yeah, I just, I'd say, like, the hair just stood up on the back of my neck, and I'm like, you know, I'm like, okay. And then we look at the screen, and then lo and behold, there's some bumps start coming, but they look too far away, and I'm like, I'm thinking, oh, you know, close, but I don't think he's going to get it. 
And then the bumps get bigger and bigger. And with that, like Kelly takes off just before the buzzer, surfs the wave flawlessly, gets the score and comes out. And then that's uh, that totally changes like Andy Ines' year. And, and as, as you mentioned, you know, possibly the, the outcome of the, of, you know, the beginning of the end of that story between Andy and Kelly. It was wow. great that I witnessed that firsthand. Wow. Incredible. Yeah, one, one of, you know, perhaps one of the most important waves in in professional men's competitive surfing yeah yeah oh jim right boys what an epic story um you know that that it has always been uh one of the great tales um you know uh, well of, of welsh surf culture even though the majority of it takes place in france um and and i'm just absolutely stoked to have been able to to actually hear it from you jim you know in in, in, in such detail and you know you're yeah, you're you're a, a classic, classic, great. You know, one of the great storytellers of the surf world, and that you know that is why, um, you know, we we started this podcast in the first place. Really, was to get you know th- there's just so many wonderful stories in surfing and all the people I know in surfing, and that just, Jem, thanks for your time. Uh, it's it's been an absolute blast, and uh, I, I reckon we're gonna have to have you back for some point. You keen? Always keen. I'd love to. It's been great. And I second that, Jem. I mean, you know, as uh, as always, I mean, that story that you told brought it back to me, like, and the clarity in the way that you told that story was fantastic. And uh, thanks very much for your time. And uh, maybe one day we'd be able to do it again. How good would that be? That would be good. <laughs> thanks, Jem. So that's it, listeners. Thanks for lending us your ears until a fortnight Monday when another inspiring figure from the world of surf will be telling their tale into whatever app you use to download us, Apple, Spotify, Google and YouTube. And if you're liking what you hear, do please hit subscribe and stop to leave us a review. Here at Crest Podcast in partnership with Elusive, we're also on the permanent lookout for surf travel nightmares. So if you know of one, do let us know. We're at the email address castcrest at gmail.com as well as being on Instagram and Twitter. Two weeks today, we're going to meet the Irish big wave legend Almini, whose mind-boggling swim through darkness through the 2020-21 winter raised over £15,000 for the depression charity Aware. We'll hear about what it's like to do 100k at night in the coldest waters of the year, as well as some great tales from Al's big wave career. And much more before then, here's wishing you all some more spring swell wherever you are. Diocham grando a gwarachi tronesa. Bye. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Welsh there, right? Yeah, well, I, 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 I gave thought... you a paper version without the Welsh on it as well. <laughs> well I thought I'd give it a go. I thought I'd better give it a go. That was really good. Oh, there we are. Yeah, it'll sound good, but it's got that. Uh, it's got the little punk rock riff over the back of it. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.